Good afternoon. So let's make sure that we are in the right place. So if we could bring up the uh, presentation, I'm not sure what I need to do here since uh, there we are. So the, uh, the presentation today will be about building a following and how to create a global phenomenon with less than 6,797.44 euros. That's less than $10,000. So this is my localization for the Paris presentation. And we'll jump right into it. I have a lot that I'd like to share. And hopefully, because I am not the most uh, charismatic presenter, the content will be actionable and helpful for at least a few people here. So the guiding principle of everything that I'll be discussing is whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Uh, much like Warren Buffett says, you pay a very heavy price for a cheery consensus. So chances are, if you're doing things the way many other people are doing them, it's not the most effective, not the most efficient path. So first of all, the title, The 4-Hour Workweek, as you can see, is on some level the bane of my existence. Uh, also a blessing, that was not the initial title of the book. The initial title of The 4-Hour Workweek was actually Drug Dealing for Fun and Profit. And uh, I was rejected by 26 out of 27 publishers, had no intention to be an author. It was then bought by Random House, and I was informed by Walmart that the title was vetoed. I could not use Drug Dealing for Fun and Profit. They did not find it as funny as I did. And rather than get into a large battle with the publisher at the time, which I would lose, I decided to set a campaign with Google AdWords. And it lasted one week, cost less than $200. What I did is I bid on search terms related to the content in the book, like world travel, retirement, language learning, et cetera. And then used 12 prospective titles and subtitles as the ad headline and ad text, respectively. So at the end of one week, I could see which combination of the highest click through. It was the four hour work week, escape nine to five, live anywhere, and join the new rich, by many standard deviations. And that ended up working. Uh, it ended up in 35 languages at last count in more than 40 printings. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how that happened. But it all began with very simple, very cheap, but effective testing. So December 26, 2006 was when I sat down the day after Christmas and realized I'd sold a book, I'd written a book, and I had no real marketing plan. The publisher dictated that I couldn't touch print, I couldn't touch radio, couldn't touch a number of things, and I had to decide how I was going to play my card. I had very little budget. In total, ended up spending uh, about 20 5,000, I would say, 16 or 18 of which, rather, was wasted on a PR firm that was $6,000 retainer for three months, and they produced one print article. Uh, the rest of it was spent on airfare and on sending out books. So there are a few assumptions. Number one, the most consistent suggestions from best-selling authors, and this does apply to people outside of publishing, were that the two most effective mechanisms for promotion were blogs and radio. Radio was decreasing in importance, blogs were increasing in importance. Ended up that was very accurate, NPR being the most important of the radio. Uh, second, most books fail or stick one to two weeks. Of the more than 200,000 books that are published each year in the US alone, uh, less than 5% of them earn back their advances. And then of those that hit the bestseller lists, they generally stay for one or two weeks and then they fall off. And my hypothesis for the reasoning behind that or the explanation for that was that the focus was on promotion like television that expired as soon as it came out. There was no lasting benefit uh, to that type of media exposure. Uh, conversely, online can appreciate with time. So if you have evergreen features, blog posts, etc., with additional links, with additional Google juice, that real estate actually increases in value over time. Uh, and using that approach, the four-hour work week as of last month was on the New York Times business bestseller list for two and a half years unbroken. The goal, though, in the beginning, I didn't expect it to succeed uh, as, as much as it did, certainly not at all. Perhaps one printing, it's been through, uh, like I mentioned, more than 40. So the objective in the very beginning was 20,000 early evangelists. That's a term used by Eric Ries uh, in Lean Startup and by other people. And 20,000 is a very specific number. The pressure I knew would be to address the largest general market possible, broaden, 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 don't forget the, the housewives in the Midwest, et cetera, to the point where my message became so diluted it appealed to no one. The 20,000 number is very specific for a reason. If you have 10,000 unit sales in a given week, you have a very high likelihood of hitting at least one national list. Uh, that could be Wall Street Journal, could be New York Times. But there's also the likelihood of having someone like a Harry Potter or the equivalent of nonfiction knock you off the list. So I wanted two weeks, 10,000 units per week. 
Uh, and that initial demographic, I look at customer acquisition in a very phased approach. You can't reach the whole world all at once. It's too expensive. It's too general. I wanted the 20 to 35-year-old tech-savvy males on primarily tech blogs. And there were five to 10 of them that I ended up targeting. I wanted a surround sound effect. This was by virtue of budget, among other things, meaning that rather than extending and uh, spacing my media over the span of many weeks, the typical approach is four to eight weeks, I wanted to do all of it in the first week. I wanted to be unavoidable for those 20,000 uh, target early adopters. And of course, that's converted from a much larger number. Uh, if I could suggest you read one article and one article only on marketing as it relates to this and any type of product launch, it would be 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, co-founding editor of Wired Magazine. Uh, KK.org is where you'll find that. So to attract and retain and grow a fan base or a user base that then turns into a global fan base or user base, data is king. So you can see here, this is a screenshot of Crazy Egg, which is one of the tools I use to follow click patterns, along with Google Analytics. Very simple. I don't use many tools. But you can see here that those people coming through Google.de from Germany are very interested in Tim's favorites. Uh, conversely, those people coming from the US really don't give a rat's ass about my favorites at all. They care about the all-time favorites. And by gathering data in, in, uh, in this approach very, very cheaply, that then informed how I would launch the book in different countries. So in Germany, it became a, uh, a multiple printing bestseller, partially because of how I treated offline media after gathering this. On the bottom, you see my most effective blog posting times. I was told it would be Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, uh, specifically for sites like Dig and so forth. Uh, ended up, when I did the testing, that it was 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. California time, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So you have to test. When people tell you that you have to, let's say, in the case of blogs, post six times a day or three times before lunch, test those assumptions. I often will go three to four weeks without posting. So there are three tipping points I'd like to discuss that are representative of three different types of media exposure that I think are necessary to trigger the cascade that then leads to a global phenomenon. Uh, they're not necessarily enough in and of themselves, but I, I have yet to see them lacking in something that really comes out of left field as a sleeper hit. Uh, so the first that I'll talk about is indirect. So 43 folders is uh, Merlin Mann's creation, initially focused on getting things done, approaches to productivity. I'd met with Merlin briefly, but didn't expect that he would have the inclination of the time to do a post about me. Uh, very much coincidentally, met Brian Oberkirk at South by Southwest 2007, where I first spoke about the book. Uh, Brian's very smart, uh, very nice guy. We did a podcast, and only after the fact that I realized that he was on Merlin's man, Merlin Mann's blog roll. So that was enough, the podcast in and of itself, to give Merlin and the people at 43 Folders the excuse to link to me. This was the first indirect exposure that then triggered many other similar coverages. Uh, so one of the approaches that you can take away from this is rather than targeting the highest traffic blogs, uh, and I could only look at this in retrospect, is to target the thought leaders that are read by the traffic leaders. So don't be a traffic bigot. It is usually the easiest way to get lost in the crowd. It's like saying, my marketing plan for the book is to get on Oprah. Good luck. It's not going to happen. The second is Scobalizer. I know uh, Robert Scoble's here somewhere. Uh, and Robert had a huge impact on, on the book's trajectory. Really mentioned in passing in this particular post, hey, I'm going on a trip and I'm taking this book with me. That was about it. And that, that put the book in the top five on Amazon for two to three days. Uh, to compare that, the Today Show in the United States, which is considered one of the top shows uh, in the United States for morning shows, certainly, I was with Matt Lauer being uh, in, a, in a debate with Donnie Deutsch. It was just the dream setup, and it took the book to about number 12 for three hours to give you uh, an idea of the relative impact. And then the last, which is very, very important, and you, you can see this with the Slanket and other types of infomercial products that have uh, sprouted subcultures, is the meta, meaning uh, I know that uh, Steve Rubell is here as well. It's micro persuasion. So the content of the book aside, the launch of the book after the first and second week then became newsworthy. The fact that it was popular became news in and of itself. And that is a very important ingredient. So the concept, if I were to uh, emphasize one, when it comes to media, when it comes to pitching, is selling around the product. So very seldom is your product or service as interesting to everybody else as it is to you. 
uh, meaning that if you talk to someone at the New York Times and pitch them a feature article on your website, it's probably not going to happen. So you need to get very good at selling around the product. And there's a very easy way to remember uh, the three principal approaches that I took. PPC, like pay-per-click, but in this case, it's somewhat Don King-esque. Phenomenize, polarize, and communitize. I don't think those are real words, at least the, the, the first and the last. But the first ties into uh, what Tony said earlier uh, related to offering a movement or a cause. This is very, very important. Uh, I did not feel that the book and the associated movement fit into time management, nor did it fit into productivity. And as a result, I created the category of lifestyle design. I created this label of lifestyle design. And the objective was to create a worldwide movement of people who rejected this deferred life plan that's based on retirement. Uh, never made any attempt to protect that with trademarking or anything else. And lifestyle design quickly made its way into the popular vernacular, at least online. And uh, that really added the fuel that gave the book the mileage that it had. Secondly, polarizing. You'll see in the top right, there is uh, From Geek to Freak, How I Gained 34 Pounds of Muscle in 28 Days, which I did as an experiment with San Jose State University. Uh, I did that all, that experiment, two years before the book came out. I had it all documented. I had no use for that. The traffic wouldn't do me any good at that point. So I saved it. And again, selling around the product has nothing to do with the book, but it has a lot to do with the author. And all I wanted was either a link to my blog, which launched simultaneously, or to the Amazon page. I didn't care about a feature article about me. I wanted a link. That is it. Uh, and this put me on Wired the very next day, about six hours later. Last but not least, once you attract people, you have to retain them. This is as true with a fan base as it is with customers. And uh, I did that two ways. I created a forum, but also encouraged people and you, uh, to form their own support groups, four-hour work week for programmers, four-hour work week for writers, mothers, et cetera. I was never going to write those books on Ning.com and had a competition uh, to see who could build the largest community in the shortest period of time. And there are dozens of these uh, groups online, on Facebook, and elsewhere. These are just a few findings. Uh, that apply to blog, but also apply elsewhere. And it'll give you an idea of my methodology for testing. This is a blog post uh, on the shortness of life, an introduction to Seneca. It is 15 pages long, 15 pages printed. And it did very well on many of the social media sites that, that you would think of, Dig and elsewhere. And uh, the way I achieved that is by doing a read time for bolded parts that was three to four minutes. But what I want to point out are a few things that were omitted as well. Because oftentimes, what you don't do that's important, not what you do. Uh, so in the top left, you'll see that there's a red line. And that indicates the omission of time and date. So for anything that's not on the home page, that date is omitted. People online, ever so now and increasingly so in the future, are addicted to new. So if you have anything that indicates age or old, I suggest you put it at the bottom. And that can apply as much to other types of content as it does to blog posts. All of these changes, coincidentally, uh, produced double-digit positive changes in the metrics that I was tracking. Uh, the gear that you see boxed at the top was blank. Uh, that was used to see what the click volume would be for people who would be then interested in anything commercial on the site, which I'll be exploiting later. Uh, on the top right, another line, uh, even though I'm biased as an investor in Twitter and there are a lot of good uses, uh, I found that a very high percentage of the traffic I was taking to my site was immediately then getting fed back to Twitter, which uh, if you're spending a lot of attention or time or money, if you're doing a, a, a full rollout, is uh, very self-defeating. So I still have the Twitter feed, but it's down further on the bottom right, on the right-hand side. Other things, current hits versus all time. If you have all time showing first, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They never change. So the current hits is just a rotating 30-day limit. That way, people are introduced to new content, and you have more inbound links, and more of your content is seated higher on Google. Very simple things, again, that I encourage you to test. Copy is the most underestimated uh, element that you can split test. So if you look at the bottom right, at topics, that's usually categories. And by simply changing it to topics, the click-through rate on all of those elements all of those different categories increased by more than, more than double digits. So from wording to read time, test it all, chances are that whatever people assume is right is absolutely wrong. How I do research, this is to, again, retain a user base or a fan base or to encourage them to then uh, spread whatever it is that I'm doing to other people. And this is a, a self-propagating uh, phenomenon that you want to encourage. 
very simple. I collect materials that I think might be of interest to my fan base via Evernote. Then I set up a question of some type on Slinkset. So Slinkset.com is a Y Combinator company, was a Y Combinator company. It allows you to create your own dig in about 30 seconds. And then I use Twitter to direct people there. And it's very easy to get a st statistically significant response that allows you to up your hit rate from anywhere from like 20 to 30 to 80 or 90%. Uh, short note on video and photos. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in video, I think primarily because it takes a hell of a lot less time to produce. Uh, in some cases, not all cases. Uh, what I've found, uh, this particular video that you're looking at is how to peel a hard-boiled egg without peeling. Again, does that have anything to do with the four-hour work week? No, it does not. Uh, about a minute long, and it has somewhere between two and four million views. Uh, what's important here is that when you produce a video, you have value add. You have some type of additional material in text. I prefer text. Nothing travels faster than text. That way, people will not be linking directly to YouTube, but to your site. All right, very important note. And just in passing, so on the right-hand side, if you want to see how I craft something specifically for StumbleUpon, this is the most effective post that I've had on StumbleUpon, how to be Jason Bourne. The way you find photographs, if you're a, uh, a budget startup or a stu startup with a budget, which all of you should be if you're in a startup, is you simply go to Flickr, go to Advanced Search, Creative Commons, and then sort by most interesting. And you can find fantastic photos uh, at, at no cost as long as you're attributing. Uh, I want to point out a few things that are non-specific to books, because I think that uh, it will be broadly applicable to many people here. Uh, this is a startup called Jiminy. It is now called Daily Burn. I'm an advisor to this company. And you can see this is the home page they had when I first uh, became involved with them. It's not a bad home page, but that arrow right there indicates the fold, above the fold, on a 15-inch monitor. And there are about 25 clickable elements above the fold. Uh, and you run into a paradox of choice issue very often uh, that leads people to par paralysis, and they simply abandon the page. So what we did, there was only two co-founders. They had no extra cycles. They really didn't have time to do a redesign. All we did is remove just about everything so that they had five clickable elements, remove the horizontal navigation bar at the top, among other things, and this improved conversion 20%. All right, so conversion to sign up improved 20% simply by taking literally about 15 minutes to remove some HTML. This was uh, some testing we did with Google Website Optimizer. Two changes I want you to note here. This was an additional 16% improvement in conversion. Is the join for free in the center, and there's something very visibly missing here, and that is take the tour. We removed the tour button, and it jumped 16%. There are other graphical changes, but uh, tested elsewhere, the join for free in the center, as well as removing the tour, increases conversion. But sometimes less is less. Oftentimes less is more, but sometimes less is less. This is another company I'm involved with called Postris. Very, very um, successful in, in traffic growth, basically blogging via email. But uh, there's one question they weren't answering very effectively, and that was, but how will I use it? And I sat down with them and asked them very specifically, well, what are your four or five most important demographics? And let's sort them by the fastest growing. And uh, we created what you see here on the top right. So who's it for? First-timers, casual bloggers, social media pros, families, and groups. And this answers the question, but how will I use it? And when you roll over one of those, there's a question. Hopefully, the person answers yes to that. And then there are one or two benefits. Uh, this resulted in an 80% conversion improvement just by adding elements that answer the question, how will I use this? So in closing, I would like to give a cautionary note to those people who are, are hoping to use blogging or social media for promotional purposes. How not to pitch. So this is a book here. I hope they serve beer in hell. Tucker Max, some of you may or may not know. If you want to be mortally offended, you can go to tuckermax.com. Very, very offensive, but very, very smart. Uh, was rejected by just about every publisher under the sun. Uh, finally sold his book, made a New York Times bestseller on his own. And uh, he received, at that time, a press release from a publicist at one of the publishers that had rejected him. And the, and the release read, Dear Mr. Max, no one calls Tucker Mr. Max. Dear Mr. Max, you are an influencer in your community. We know you will love the included book, and thank you so much in advance for sharing it with your community. And that was the letter. Zero due diligence, nothing at all. Long story short, he said, I'll do you the favor of promoting the book. He took it, that letter it is, put it on his forum, and that woman had to quit her job two weeks later. So don't be lazy. 
Make sure that if you're dealing with someone who's busy, a busy blogger, take the time to craft something as thorough as you would if you were dealing with someone at the New York Times. So last but not least, plan big, but test assumptions and start small. Those thousand true fans, that's all you need to trigger the domino effect that will result in a global phenomenon. It's how you pick those thousand people. So doing the unthinkable is easier than you think. And that's the end. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. Really fantastic.